morning. It is great to have you in this service today online. Because of the predicted weather that was going to take place today, we moved our parking lot service to online only. You know, we're going to pray that throughout our singing today, the Lord's Supper, the prayers, and through the preaching of God's Word, that three things are going to happen. That we are going to draw closer to Jesus Christ. Second, that we're going to see how God works in the world of yesterday and today. And third, that we will have the courage to tell someone about Jesus Christ this week. I hope that today's service is a blessing for you. May God bless you. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. 
pray, please. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day, for the seasons, for the beauty of the coolness of the weather, for the, the snow and the rain. Father, we're just so very thankful for the earth that you created. Father, we're thankful for our church family here in Stillwater. Father, we know that there's so many of our church family that are in need of your healing and in need of uh, uh, your uh, over oversight and father we just ask that you continue to to bless us we know father there's some of our family that have have the covid virus and we just ask father that you comfort them and help them over overcome father we're thankful for those who uh have uh, gone through surgery and it's been successful and uh we know father there's some that are, are still waiting for surgery but father we want uh, those that are in rehab to uh, overcome to be uh, help get their health back and to just be uh, be able to come back to uh, the, their family. Father, we're thankful for the church family in its its broad sense of uh, throughout the world. We're thankful, Father, that we can call you a righteous heavenly Father, and that you call us your children. Father, is such a a blessing for us to be called your your children. Father, we also know that uh, there's, a, there's people that are in, in uh, financial need at this time of the, the year during this holiday season. Father, we ask that you bless them to help them to uh, manage, manage through this holiday season. And Father, we just are thankful for all of our church family, for all of those, Father, that, that uh, will be uh, meeting with us, whether it, it be via uh, Zoom or Facebook or live. Father, we just ask that you continue to uh, bless us. Father, we just uh, ask that you that uh, that you bless the uh, leadership uh, here at the church. Father, we ask that you bless the uh, elders, the deacons, the ministers, the staff, the uh, program leaders. Father, we're we're involved in so many different uh, things for for your for your sake. And Father, we hope that uh, we glorify you in all that we do. Father, we're thankful for uh, you blessing us uh, on, on a daily basis and lifting us up. And Father, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for your spirit. And we're thankful for your word. And Father, we lift this prayer up in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Angels we have heard of high sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply echoing their joyous strains.
Good morning. I hope that you have your Bibles with you this morning. Today we're going to be in the first chapter of Matthew and the first chapter of Luke. The first chapter of Matthew and the first chapter of Luke. This morning I want to pause our study on the book of Acts to talk about Christmas today and next Sunday. I want to talk about Christmas really for three reasons. When I was at Oklahoma Christian a number of years ago working on my bachelor's degree, I had the opportunity to have some great teachers. And one of those professors was Howard Norton. And in some of the chapel sessions, these were his words to us as students. He said, fellas, you need to be sure that you're preaching what people are thinking about. And he went on to say, you especially need to be preaching about the holidays when the whole world focuses on those events. You know, even in the midst of COVID-19, even in this dark hour of so many deaths and so much sickness in our country and around the world, people are beginning to think about Christmas. Whether you go out to the grocery store or whether you've been around your neighborhood, or whether you have been out to some Christmas light displays, there are some things that you're seeing right now in our community and the communities that you're viewing this lesson from. You're seeing the angels in many front yards. You're seeing the nativity set. You're seeing the manger. You're seeing the story of Jesus Christ. We need to preach about Christmas. But there's a second reason and it's an event that took place in Hutchinson a number of years ago. I don't believe I've told you this story. A family had lost a mother and father in Hutchinson, and they were going through their home, and they were trying to give many of the things that they'd owned and treasured over the years to other people. And this son and daughter called the church building. They said, believe it or not, they said, we've got, some, we've got a life-size nativity set. And we want to know, can your church use that nativity set? Well, I knew what some people would think, but I didn't want to go there. And I told her on the telephone, we would love to have that nativity set. And we'll put it to good use. You know, Carl and the kids and I were happy to be members of that congregation. And we feel so blessed to be members of the Stillwater Church family. Because in both of these congregations... We believe in Christmas. We believe what people are thinking about all over our communities. For example, you know the last couple of Christmases, I can remember that we had a Christmas play and production inside the giant auditorium or in our foyer. Do you remember the camel? Do you remember the wise men? Do you remember baby Jesus? Do you remember the star? It was spectacular. 
And you know, as I think about our children now, they've been working on some manger scenes, and they've had a removable Jesus. And next Sunday, because of the bad weather t today, they're going to be having a Christmas production where they're going to talk about Jesus in our parking lot with a video. They've also got a nativity escape room, and there are other things that are taking place. But finally, we need to talk about Christmas this morning because of something that Stafford North said years ago. Stafford North said, if you had the ability to take Jesus Christ off the minds of every human being during Christmas time, would you do it? Now, before you can even answer that question, Stafford North said, God forbid. Listen closely to these words. It was in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy that God sent an angel named Gabriel to Mary. She was a virgin, and she was betrothed, or she was engaged to a man named Joseph. Her response was fear just like any person who saw an angel. And that angel wanted her to recognize that she had found favor with God and that she was going to have a child and that she would give birth to a son and that she was to give him the name Jesus. You know this story. Mary was confused. Mary was confused and she told the angel, how can this be because I'm a virgin? Now, I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. When we think about the virgin birth, we're talking about Jesus being born without the agency of a human father. And Gabriel looked at Mary and he said, The Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you will have the Son of God. Gabriel gives Mary some additional information that I'd really not thought about this week in particular. Gabriel said, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I want you to listen to Mary's response. It was, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. That is a statement of great faith. And you know, as we think about Luke 1 and Matthew 1, there are at least three important lessons. Listen carefully. These lessons are just as important as the applications to this passage. And this is the first. Sometimes we have a false assumption that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, everything is going to be okay in every way. Some would tell you that if you're a believer in Jesus, you'll not fight criticism. You'll fight no pain. You'll fight no trouble. Let me tell you what. When you look at Mary's story and what Gabriel told her and you think about how events transpired, God's favor was anything but what we mentioned a moment ago. And what that tells me in Stillwater today is this important fact. I can be in the middle of God's will and still be in the midst of some difficult circumstances. But you know, as a believer, I know that in the end, it's going to be okay. Not because of my will, but because of the will of God. Well, I want you to go back again to that announcement, and I want you to think about what Gabriel had told Mary. She would want to tell this good news to someone. You know, when I think about Carla being pregnant with our daughter, Piper, when she found out that she was pregnant, the first thing that we did was we called our mothers and our fathers. They lived about 500 miles from us in Jefferson City. They were overjoyed with what we told them. Then we called our siblings and we told them, Carla's pregnant. And then we called some of our best friends. And do you know, when our daughter became pregnant about eight months ago, we couldn't believe that our little girl was going to bring a baby into the world. You've been there. You've made those calls. You know, if you've got a child or you've got a grandchild that's accomplished something great in school or in sports, you want to tell them the good news. 
think about this with Mary and the news that she had been told. Think very carefully. Would Mary tell her mother or father? How would they react? Would they be skeptical? Would they be reserved? Would they be apprehensive? Would she tell Joseph, her fiancé? Well, you know the answer to the question. She wanted to share the news with someone that could understand. You see, that takes us back to the message from Gabriel that Elizabeth was going to bring a child into the world. And that's exactly who Mary went to see. She went to see Elizabeth. And you remember in that Luke 1 text that when Elizabeth and Mary met, it says that the baby leaped in Elizabeth's womb. You know, I've heard my wife and my daughter both say when they were pregnant, they could feel the baby kick. Or they could feel the baby hit in their pregnancies. Can you imagine the baby that Elizabeth had? That's John the Baptist. He leaped in the womb. And the Holy Spirit filled Elizabeth and she said to her, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child that you will bear. You know, there's a second important lesson there for us. And it's this fact. God has placed people in your life that you can look to in times of joy, in times of sadness. You know, there are going to be times in my life I'm going to have to lean on someone in the church. When it comes to my relationship with Jesus or someone that I'm dating, or maybe it's something in the workplace, or maybe it's a decision about a career, or maybe it's a decision about a marriage or about finances, I need to seek out brothers and sisters in Christ that God has already placed within view of you. And I need to go to them. And they need to be people of faith. People that walk with Jesus. And men and women that have the ability through God to tell you what you need to hear. Sometimes instead of just what you want to hear. Well, you find out that... Mary stays with Elizabeth for three months. I'm not the best with numbers, but I can add those. She was in her sixth month of her pregnancy, seven, eight, nine. I just wonder this morning if Mary stayed with Elizabeth until John the Baptist was born. Well, we don't know the answer, but she was with her for three months, and then she went back. Well, that's the calling of Mary. I want you to think about the calling of Joseph. You know, we don't know if Mary told Joseph. We don't know how she told him, if she waited to tell him. But this one fact we know. In Joseph's mind, one thing had happened. His fiance, the one that he was engaged to, the one that he was betrothed to, had been with another man. And in Joseph's mind, it was betrayal, and it was heartbreak, and it was despair. And you know, when I think about what he was going to do, I think about engagements that I have seen in my own life that have been broken. People in the church, and people that were friends outside of the church, and I remember the church giving a shower for one couple and that engagement broke apart and then they had to talk about if they should send back the presents and if and when and how. It was really tough. But you know, our engagements here in Stillwater and the surrounding communities is far different from the engagement back in Jesus' day. Remember that Mary and Joseph were betrothed. This usually was a year before the marriage proper. And the only way that you could break a betrothal and engagement was divorce. And I want you to look very carefully at Matthew chapter 1. Joseph didn't want to have her feel and to see public disgrace. So he was going to divorce her quietly. You see that? He was going to divorce her quietly. You know, when I think about that word divorce, I'm reminded that we have some family members that have been through divorce. And the words that come to my mind are pain, 
trauma and the fracturing of a relationship. Jerry Jones, an individual who has been here with his wife Lynn and do workshops all over the country, he says that sometimes going through a divorce is worse than a death. And as I look at you this morning in this online form of communication, or if you're listening to us on the radio, if you've gone through a divorce in the past, or you are going through a divorce right now at this moment, I want to tell you one thing. I don't know what you're going through. But God understands. And there are people in this church family that have been through divorces, and they, in many respects, understand exactly what you're going through. But there's something here powerful for me and for you, whether I have been divorced or whether I've not been divorced. And this is the fact that Joseph was going to choose to be compassionate and merciful to the person that he thought betrayed him. He was going to take the high road. He didn't want to subject her to public disgrace. And that's why, what we said a moment ago, he wanted to divorce her quietly. You know, I think there's a third and important lesson here, and it's this fact. We need to respond with kindness and mercy when we are hurt in our homes, in our relationships with our spouses, and with folks in the church. Let me tell you what. We're all human. And one time or the other, in your life or in my life, you're going to be hurt. Someone is going to say something. Someone's going to do something in your home or in the church family that's going to really hurt us. And we've got a choice on how we're going to respond. You know, there's a lot of examples that I could give from my life and your life, but let me go back in time, which is probably better. I'd been asked to conduct a funeral for a member of a congregation where I'd served at previously a number of years back. Noah was probably seven or eight years old, and I had him. And in that funeral, I mentioned a couple of times that the deceased had worked at the blind school in that community. That's what the family told me. Well, let me tell you what. After the service was over, and nearly everyone had left, Noah was standing beside me, and someone came up, and they absolutely just literally took me to the ground. They said, I am offended and upset and angry that you could call that the blind school. Do you know what you've said? Do you know how you've hurt people? You know, in my mind, I was thinking, I've driven... 200 miles. I'm not the minister of this congregation. And that's what the family said. That's what I thought, but I didn't say it out loud. But you know, I acknowledged to him that I was sorry. Because you know, it wasn't the blind school, it was the school of the blind. When Noah and I got back into the car, he said, Dad, why did that man hate you? I had one of two choices. I could tell Noah what I was thinking in my mind, in my heart at that moment, or I could tell him, son, I made a mistake. I said something wrong, and we need to do right. I mean, could you imagine how Mary felt? The one that she loved was going to divorce her. Then you think about the dream in Matthew chapter 1. God's fingerprints are all over these pages. And an angel of God appears to Joseph in a dream, in a vision. And this angel of the Lord wanted Joseph to know that you should not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And do you know what you find at the end of Matthew chapter 1? That Joseph did what the Lord commanded. Joseph obeyed. Joseph did not divorce Mary, and he took Mary into his home as his wife. I mean, can you imagine that with me this morning? We've talked about three important lessons in the 21st century, lessons that are just as, as 
important today as they were in Jesus' days. Don't get caught up with the false assumption that if you're a believer, everything is going to be okay. If you're a believer, there can still be difficulties in your life. But the difference is, you have Jesus as your Savior. Second, that God places people in your life that you could depend upon. I'm so grateful that I've got some men and women that I can lean on, that I can call, and that I can speak to. And the third lesson was to return kindness and goodness when I'm criticized or when I'm hurt. But I believe that there are also some important applications. And this is the first one. We need to reaffirm our belief in the statement of faith that we have here at the Church of Christ in Stillwater. We need to reaffirm our belief in our statement of faith. You know, you'll see our statement of faith just as you walk into the building. In fact, I tried to pull the statement of faith off of the wall and to bring it into my office just to show you, but I couldn't get it off the wall. You've seen the statement of faith when you became a member of this church. You've seen the statement of faith when you were baptized, but let me remind you that in the middle of the statement of faith it says, we believe that the Bible is inspired of God. That's what the Stillwater Church of Christ believes. And in that statement of faith it says, we believe that Jesus is God's Son. And in that statement of faith it says, we believe that He came to this world. You know what the inference is? We believe in the virgin birth. It doesn't make sense. A lot of people disagree with it. But we believe it to be true. In that statement of faith that says, we believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. i tell you what. We need to reaffirm our belief in the statement of faith. Second, we need to trust the Lord when times are tough. You know, it reminds me of a proverb, one that we memorized when we were just young children. In Proverbs 3 and verse 5, these are the words, Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart and lean not upon your own understanding. You know, the miraculous birth, the virgin birth, that the Holy Spirit would cause Mary to become pregnant, that didn't make sense to Mary. It didn't make sense to Joseph. It didn't make sense to a community. But they trusted and they believed. You know, we need to trust God when there are no explanations. Have you seen this in Matthew 1 and Luke 1? That there are some details that are missing. Gabriel never gave, and the angel of the Lord, they never gave an explanation how they were to tell their parents how Mary had became pregnant. There was no explanation on how Mary was supposed to tell Joseph what had happened. There was no explanation on what she was to say to those in the community or when there would be self-doubts in her own mind and in her heart. We need to trust God. I'll be real honest with you today. As I look at you in Stillwater and the surrounding communities, but especially the people that we love here, I don't know why some of you have gotten COVID and others have not. I don't know why some of your loved ones have died from COVID and others have lived. I don't know why some of your loved ones have suffered from cancer and have survived, and yet others in your family have had cancer and have died. I don't know why you lost your job when you were doing right. But I want to challenge you today, trust the Lord. Trust Him no matter what. Trust Him to know that He is on His throne. And He's going to get you through it. You know, there was a school that was having a Christmas play. And they had a young boy that was named Wallace. He was eight years old and he had special needs. He wanted to be a part of the program. They knew that he would struggle 
with lines. So they gave him the part that he thought he would do best in. They wanted him to be the innkeeper. And they gave him four words. The inn is full. So there was a young Mary and Joseph in bathrobes, and they came to the inn. And Wallace said those four words, the inn is full. And Joseph said, but my wife is pregnant. We have no place. And Wallace said, the inn is full. And Joseph and Mary begin to walk off. And he, Joseph said to the innkeeper, please, we, we don't know where to go. And Wallace said it again, the inn is full. And Mary and Joseph walked off the stage. And it was at that point that that eight-year-old with special needs began to cry. And he ran off the stage, and you could hear him with the biggest, loudest voice. He said, you can have my room. You know, there were some people at that school pageant that thought the play was ruined. But there were more folks that knew that it had a better ending. Because good had triumphed over evil. Jesus needs to be invited into our homes. Jesus needs to be a part of my life. Jesus needs to be evident in how I live and act and speak. Christmas is a beautiful time of the season. May God bless you today. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare in room. And heaven and nature and sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and, heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their souls. Sounding joy, sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, for us the curse for is us found. The curse is found. Good morning. You know, the passages uh, related to the birth of Jesus has always been one of my favorites, and maybe that's because of the Christmas holiday and all the joy and, and things that, that go with that. And, but while reading prepared for this today, a couple of things stood out that I wanted to, to bring to your attention this morning. Um, Matthew 1, 20 and 21 says, and she, um, starting verse 20, But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. So the first thing that stood out to me was Jesus' whole plan was born, was to come and save us from our sins. And again in Luke 2.11, the angel appeared to the shepherds and said, A Savior is born to you today. So without the manger, there could be no cross. And then going on in Matthew 1.22 and 23, it says, Now all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So, this is a, a quote from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 7.14, and what a comforting thought to say, God is with us. He came as one of us 
tempted by all that we were tempted by, and in his 30 plus years, in his journey to the cross and ascension, he walked in our shoes and knows all the things that, that we deal with, and, and I can't help but think as a carpenter, he, he might have hit his finger with a hammer and hurt like we do, dealt with sickness like we are with the coronavirus, temptations and sin, he knows all that we're going through. Let's go ahead and pray for the bread. Father, we're thankful for this, this time together here and, and to remember Christ who came. And, and as we remember this, this time of year when he came into this world in such a glorious way, we know the ultimate plan was, was to, to walk in our shoes and ultimately um, give his life for our sins. And we're thankful for that. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. John 14, 5-7 says this, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you had known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. I was going to use this, this passage just a little differently and, and talk about you know, there's no cross without the manger, but as I read it, it, it stood out to me that uh, because the baby that was born in the manger and walked 30-ish 30, 30 years on this earth, and because of that we have seen the Father, we have seen God in the flesh. And what a comforting, comforting thought. Let's go ahead and pray for the cup. Our Lord, our God, we're thankful so much for for you sending Jesus in, into our world and, and walking with us for the the, the, the time he was with us and, and going through what we go through and Lord we just uh, as, as we prepare to take this cup we're just thankful that uh, that he was willing to go to the cross and and to shed his blood for the the cleansing of, of our sins and we just uh, thank you for that and lift this up to you in the name of Christ amen, amen. as we prepare for contribution We've talked a lot recently about some of the financial challenges over the last few years and, and of course, giving money, which is appropriate at the time of contribution, and, and even most recently in the Elders Forum, kind of giving an update on that. But I have to confess a little bit this morning that, uh, you know, just uh, I struggle with just a little bit of the burdens of life and the busyness of life and, and a little bit of apathy, and I have a feeling I may not be alone in that. Um, but I want to challenge you this morning to pray that God will light the fire in your soul and that you will find ways to, to give not just money but time, effort, and talent in service to God and in service to those around you. And um, if, if you need ideas, we start with Matthew 25 and read that. It's a lot of ways, good, good ideas of service in that. And, and there's also ministries you can get plugged in here. Um, so I just want to leave with a, a couple of passages first one is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain for the Lord. And then Galatians 6, 9 and 10. And let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those in the household of faith. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we're thankful for all the blessings that you provide us, not only our financial blessings, but also the, the talents and gifts that you've given us. Just, just help us to find ways to use that in, into your service, into your glory. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Go and tell it, go, go and tell about it, go and tell it, go, go and tell about it, go, go and tell it, go, go and tell about it, go, go and tell it, go, go and tell about it, go, go and tell it, go, go and tell about it, go, go and tell it, go, go and tell about it, go, go and tell it, go, go and tell about it, go. Shepherds all were watching while
Jesus Christ is born.